Hello everyone. Hi, I'm uh, Professor Daniel Chua, Head of the School of Humanities and also the Director of the Faith and Global Engagement Initiative here at the University of Hong Kong. Very warm welcome to you. Thank you for coming to our uh, Faith at Work series. I like to call this series of talks, not really career talks, but real career talks, because these talks aren't about how to get a career, it's about the reality of a career. And I always like to mention a very famous story about a farmer, a sower, that goes out to sow seed uh, on his farm. So he has this bag with all these seeds and he's scattering the seed and it ends up on different soil. And the soil I want you to think about today is the soil that is full of thorns and weeds because these seeds land in that soil and they begin to grow and then the thorns and the weeds, they crowd around the growth of this plant and they basically destroy it. And it's a little bit like that I think sometimes uh, for students when they go out into the real world as we said because here at Hong Kong U we groom future leaders so you like that seed with all that potential to grow it and we just sort of scatter you out there you know into the world and you land on different soil but a lot of us land on that thorny weedy soil and at first we grow really well and then things happen the weeds grow around us so really when you get a career it's not necessarily the beginning of success it could be the beginning of compromise. It could be the beginning of a very dehumanizing process. It could be the beginning of a loss of values and of vision. So to address these issues, we have invited um, four alumni that have been successful in their careers. And today I'm delighted to be able to welcome Anthony Leung. Uh, he is both a person in the financial sector and also a public servant. He started off as a banker in City Core and he moved on as uh, Asian Pacific Chairman for uh, Chase Manhattan, JP Morgan, and then uh, now he is the Chairman Regionally of uh, Blackstone. Uh, as a public servant, he was a Financial Secretary here, and also, you might not know this, the Chairman of the Education Commission. So, uh, what Hong Kong U is like today, and indeed even your curriculum, uh, is a result, a direct result of decisions made by Anthony. So if you are happy with your experience here, you know who to thank. If you're unhappy, what's your problem, you know? <laughs> so please welcome Anthony Leung. Okay. By the choice of the uh, topic, career talk that uh, you do not believe that this is a recruitment talk. But in any case, um, I saw at least uh, last year when the, there were a lot of discussions on who should be the chief executive, there was somebody that uh, encouraged young people, and all of you are young, uh, that if you work hard enough, you can be another Li Ka Shing. Now, who wants to be uh, the next Li Ka Shing? Which of the Lee Which is good. And obviously there were uh, debates about whether you can be a Lee Kang in today's world. Uh, the fact of the matter is, in today's world, the wealth gap is widening. And also, many young people in this world are finding that there are kind of less and less opportunities to work. Because there are at least a number of forces at work and I'm not going to go into that in detail, but I just outlined it very quickly. Um, these five forces are making a lot of young people in the whole world, not just in Hong Kong, feeling very unhappy. Uh, the forces are globalization. When you have a good product, like I mean, many of you are holding iPhones or Samsung Notes, uh, you notice that uh, these products are now selling on a global basis. So if you have a good product and a good idea, you can actually sell to the entire world, not just to your locality. But on the other hand, if you are not very skillful or do not really have a good product or not a lot of value added, the only way that you can compete is compete with your cost of labor, meaning your wage. And the bad news is in a globalized world, you are competing not just with your labor, but also with the poorest person in the entire world. So that's globalization. Then there's new technology. New technology obviously is giving us a lot of convenience. 
is opening up all kinds of opportunities, but new technology is also eliminating a lot of jobs. The next job that I believe may be eliminated, the next class of job would be drivers. As you know, Google Car has been running for about two years now. Um, I believe there, were only one, there was only one accident. Somebody just ran into it. Um, but those that have kind of sat on the car said that it's actually very safe and very stable. So imagine if all the drivers around the world were gone, so there would be less jobs. Somebody estimated that in the next 15 years or so, there'll be two billion jobs around the world being eliminated. So if you don't have skills, you don't have a good product, um, there'll be actually less jobs for you. The third uh, factor that is causing a widening wealth gap and less opportunity is the governments around the world um, kind of incurring a lot of fiscal deficit. For most countries that have the so-called one person, one vote system, while the politicians are telling the voters, say, I'm working for you, I'm working for the well-being of your children, but what they're thinking about really is getting elected. And so human nature being uh, such that you want to take more and give less. So as a politician, the easiest way to get vote is to kind of promise more welfare and reduce the tax. So they incur deficit. And the way that they finance deficit is to borrow. And when they're borrowing, instead of actually taking care of the younger generation, they're taking the money from their future generation uh, for consumption now. And this is aided by the fourth factor, and that is the printing of money. Since 1971, after the US dollar has been delinked from the gold standard, governments can print money at will. So as a result, the amount of so-called paper money is growing a lot faster than the real economy. And when you have more supply than so-called goods, guess what happened? It's actually the devaluation of paper currency. So as a result, if you are holding real assets, you don't really have to do anything. The value will rise. And if you are actually just earning your wage, chances are your, your purchasing power of your wage and your pension will be reduced. And then the last factor is the aging society. In the aging society, um, chances are uh, you live a lot longer. Right now, the average age in Hong Kong for men is 80, for women is 86, and that's today. And it includes men that are already at 79 or 81, and women at 85 and 87. So by the time that you're getting to your 80s, chances are the average life expectation would be like 100. So the notion of retiring at the age of 60 is outdated. And so a lot of people are working longer because they're healthier, and so for the young people, you say that, gee, old people like you, <laughs> um, you're occupying these positions and you're not giving up, so where is our opportunity? So these five factors are right now kind of being kind of mixed together. And so a lot of people around the world are feeling, uh, young people are feeling hopeless. In <coughs> Southern Europe, like in Spain and uh, Italy, more than half of the people between the age of uh, 19 to 24 are unemployed. And yet, on the other hand, in America, the top 1% of the population in the last 10 years took 40% of the wealth that was created. And that was twice the amount of the 10 years before that. So you see this widening wealth gap and less and less opportunities work opportunities for young people. So the wonder the world is kind of getting more and more angry. Young people are feeling unhappy and this feeling of anti-establishment is growing around the world, not just in Hong Kong. The reason I mention this is the world is changing. For those that want to be Li Ka Sheng, if you just want to be another Li Ka Sheng or if you are not kind of aiming high enough, you want to be another Anthony Leung, I've got bad news for you. <laughs> It'll be difficult because you are eyeing on the past. You're looking at yesterday. 
And yesterday is gone or is going. But on the other hand, there is all the opportunities that the decarchings or the entity learns of the world would not know and would not be able to comprehend or even compete because the world is changing fast, the world is a new world. And so we see a lot of new rich people, successful people coming up. Obviously, you mentioned Steve Jobs, Bill Gates. In our part of the world, you have Hongi Ma, Jack Ma, Ten, uh, Tencent, and also Alibaba. Their wealth, I think, would rival that of Lee Ha So the message number one is, don't just look at the old successful people, but look at something that we don't know, maybe you know, or sometimes you, even you don't know. So look to the future and look, not look to the past. And so for career advice, a lot of people ask, what should I do? You know, which one is, which industry should I go into? Which firm should I apply for? My answer is, I don't know. You should do something that you are good at. Particularly, you should do something that you really love. Because if you like something, chances are you can create something that would be different, that differentiates yourselves from your competitors. And something that you can do and do it well. And if you do it well, chances are in the new world, you'll be successful. Because each person is different. God gave us, each of us, a very different endowment. Maybe you are good at arts, maybe you are good in science, maybe you are good in IT, maybe you are good in properties, maybe you are good in some other things. God gave us something different, and so it is God's expectation that we'll use it well. Now I'm sure you heard about the Bible story that that um, a master, before he leaves for, for vacation, gave his servants, the free servants, different amounts of money. And when he returned, the first servant said that, look, master, I know that you're a hard master. I'm afraid of losing because you then scold me. I hide it under the ground and I'm now returning to you. So he just returned the principle. He was scolded by the master of being lazy. The second and the third servants, they got different amounts, but each went, out, went down and do something good with it and they returned twice the amount of money. And both were rewarded by the master. And so you, each of you, have been endowed by God differently, and God would expect us to use it well. Now, you're all looking for your first job, or kind of probably another job, uh, and you have never retired. I had retired once, and I can tell you it was boring. <laughs> it was boring. So this is the bad news for you. I'm not going to retire until God calls me back. So I'm going to occupy something that you can't expect me to retire and take the seat for you. And the reason is also because God endowed me with a lot of experience, some capabilities and a lot of network that he expects me to use. And I find enjoyment in working. And I hope that you will find enjoyment in working too. Besides choosing the work that you love and create something on your own, you should also kind of think about how do you choose between different opportunities. Now, Daniel mentioned my career briefly. Um, I've been a banker, I've been a civil servant, now I'm in the investment field on the side, I do a number of things, including the past chairman of the UGC, chairman of the Education Commission. So uh, the fact that you are enjoying or suffering the four years in, uni in university instead of three uh, is my doing. So blame me for the extra year that you are spending in Hong Kong U or kind of uh, thank me for that. But 
seht ihr die iPhone. <lacht> But if you say, well, Anthony, you must be very good in planning your, your career. I can only tell you, I did not plan it this way. When I was graduating from Hong Kong U, and by the way, that was 40 years ago, <laughs> before almost all of you were born, I'm sorry, um, I did not plan on having a career like what I had. How I chose my first job was very simple because when I was in university, my objective then was to study economics and be a professor in economics. Um, because economics in Chinese is Ging Jai. And I thought naively that it would be something relating to Ging Guok Jai Man, which is to. <coughs> which is to manage the country and to benefit the people. So I always wanted to do it. Except that when I was in Hong Kong Youth, I spent all the time except the first year kind of organizing student activities and obviously doing everything that a young university student would do. So I did not graduate with good grace. And when I graduate, like some of you, I still owe the government money and owe the, obviously the family money. So I wanted to study, uh, but since I did not get a good grade, I could not get the scholarship. So I wanted to find a job that would pay me well, and hopefully I could save enough money to go on uh, further study. So I went to the appointment service, I don't know whether it's still called appointment service today, find the best paying jobs, the top 10, except the government, because <laughs> I was like you, a bit radical and anti-establishment. So I picked the first uh, or, or the best 10 jobs, wrote a application letter, showed it to my girlfriend then. She told she it right there, said you know, all the grammatical mistakes and it was poorly written. She wrote the letter for me. <laughs> State secret. <laughs> Sent it out. And I got uh, interviews. The first interview I interviewed with an airline company um, and I quarreled with the HR person because I said that he was arrogant and I'm sure he thought the same way about me. And the, the second uh, interview was with Citibank and they hired me. Um, so that was how I entered banking. I thought of working for two years, but after two years I still owe uh, the government money, not enough money. But I find that I was actually learning more economics than my classmates who stay in university. That says a lot about university. <laughs> so I worked in Sydney for 23 years. I changed job not because I was not doing well in city. Actually, city had a vague promise that if I do a good enough job that I would be a vice chairman of the group. Um, I changed job because uh, at that point of time, it was 1996, I was in Singapore. They would not allow me to stay in Hong Kong for fear that 1997, the transition would not, would not be smooth. And I wanted to come back to Hong Kong to help Hong Kong. Because I thought that I could work anywhere in the world and probably could be successful. But on the other hand, most of the people, most of the six million people would not be able to do so. And I wanted to help the transition of Hong Kong. See, the city would not allow me to come back to Hong Kong, so I changed job and joined uh, Chase. And then I stayed there for five years. Uh, so that was, in a way, unprepared. But on the other hand, it was along the same track. The same track was, I wanted to help Hong Kong. Indeed, at that point of time, I had a plan for myself. Uh, I belong to an organization called the Young President's Organization. Every year, we would do what we call life planning. And we actually have to write down um, whether we are happy with our life and how we should make a change. And one of the exercises that we did was to write a eulogy for yourself. Uh, meaning, if somebody uh, dies, uh, there will be a eulogy being read. And you have to write a eulogy for ourselves. It's, it basically means, how would you like other people to remember you? I wrote down, I want people to remember Anthony as somebody that contributed Hong Kong and Hong uh, and, and China. 
Then by 2001, again unplanned, Mr. C.X. Tong asked me to uh, be the financial secretary. I thought for three minutes and I agreed because that was very much in line with my desire in life. <coughs> and then obviously I left the government, uh, again unplanned, and thereafter I worked for Blackstone. Again unplanned, they called me, I didn't call them. Basically, the reason why I said this is a lot of you are being taught uh, by your professors that you should have long-term planning and that kind of thing. Yes, you should have some long-term planning, but I can only tell you that, at least in my case, I didn't plan a lot of things. At least my major career moves, I did not plan. Even on the personal side, I did not plan. I mean, uh, as you know, I, I'm married to somebody that is 25 years younger. <laughs> First time I knew her was in 1992 when I saw it on the TV that somebody jumped from a diving board 10 years ago, <laughs> vanished into the water without a splash. I said, gee, who's that? A boyish looking girl. <coughs> now, if you say that, uh, Anthony, you must be a good long term planner. How on earth would I plan then? that this woman someday would be my wife and we have three kids together. Again, the point is, there are a lot of things that we don't know. God has his plans. But on the other hand, I'm not saying that you should not be planning. You should at least have something in mind that would guide you whenever opportunities come. The most important thing is your values <coughs> and your priorities in life. Because otherwise, whenever something happens, whenever an opportunity comes, you don't know what to decide. And if you don't have those values, <coughs> then you drift. You would be kind of flying, just like flying an airplane in the cloud. You don't know your direction. In my case, even though I have changed jobs, and I did not know that I mean, uh, Chase, David Morgan Chase would offer me something, or CX2 would offer me something, that was very much in line with what I wanted to do, and that was to serve Hong Kong and China. And so when something comes up, then I could decide based on my priorities. If you do not have the priorities in life, especially one those that would match your values. Whenever something comes up, chances are a lot of people would ask for so-called advice from friends. Let me tell you, it's not bad to ask for advice, but you have to think about who to who to who to ask advice from. Because if you ask advice from somebody that likes money, chances are he's only kind of way to judge an opportunity is whether it pays well. If somebody treasures freedom, that person will advise you to take something that will give you the most freedom. So make sure that you have, you have, you have your own values, you have your priorities lined up early so that when you see opportunities, you know how to make a decision. And when you ask advice, ask advice from what I call godly people. People that love the God and knows the values of God. Because then chances are you get better advice. The reason why I said that is in life, just like in managing a company, there are always new opportunities that you did not foresee. And very often you are being asked and you're being forced to make decisions. And if you do not have your values in life made clear, then you chances are you make wrong decisions. In management, in companies, there was a survey. They surveyed the successful companies that have been in existence for more than 10 years. And they asked them, did you stick with your original strategy 10 years ago? Guess what percentage of companies were successful by sticking to their original strategy and not changing in 10 years. Zero. Zero? 
No, better than zero. Five? Five what? Five percent? Uh, no, it's three percent. So, for companies that are successful, chances are they have to, have to change their strategy whenever new opportunities come. As I said just earlier on, you know, if you want to be decoshing, chances are you'll be kind of disappointed because there are new opportunities that even he did not foresee. So you'll be faced with all the opportunities in your life, whether in career, whether in uh, many other areas, and chances are every time you have to make a choice. And if you do not have your priorities and values set out, clearly thought out, then chances are uh, you may make the wrong decision. So that is the second advice I will give to you. But again, on the value, as I said, um, and I will refer to it later, hopefully you would kind of set it well in advance and hopefully is kind of in line with what our Lord wants. Uh, the third advice I would give to you other than do something that you like be prepared for changes but have your priorities ready the third one really is whatever you do, you do it well if you do something that you like then chances are you will do it well but on the other hand even there may be occasions or tasks that you would do not like Try to do it well. I mean, uh, I became a Christian only about um, uh, f uh, seven years ago. Before that, I did not believe in Him. But even when I was very young, I always had the belief, maybe it was out of kind of pride, that whatever I do, I have to do it well. And for those of you that are old enough or when you are kind of sleepless at night, uh, on the TV, sometimes you see the movies uh, produced by Shaw Brothers, COC. And usually in the beginning of the movie, they have kind of their motto coming up, COC Chut Ban, Bit Sok Gai Bin. At that point of time, I told myself, A Chong Chut Ban, Bit Sok Gai Bin. So whatever I do, it must be good. So that was my kind of motto for myself. But now, after becoming a Christian, I recognize that this is actually more important. More important because, as the Bible said, we should work as if it is for God, not for man. So if everything that we, we do, because everything that we are doing, in a way, is permitted by God and also arranged by Him, we should do it for Him. And if it is an offering for Him, then we should be doing it well, because otherwise, we will be, in a way, not obeying. Uh, our Lord's order. But I tell you, I mean, besides on the spiritual side, you have the benefit. On a kind of earthy front, doing everything that you do well is important. Because as an employer, you clearly would like everybody to perform well. And even though you have not been employed by a company, I tell you as an employer, how we choose people, at least this is how I would choose people, um, now, all of you are in Hong Kong U and it's a great university. I assume all of you will have good grades. Um, and I can tell you though, that all the applicants to good companies have good grades. Uh, we don't hire a lot of people in Hong Kong. I mean, Blackstone, every year we hire between three to five. And as the responsible officer of the company, uh, I have to sign those applications to the SFC, Securities and Futures Commission to register them. And every year I get to see that transcript. I don't see, I, I don't interview them uh, that much now because uh, other people will, will interview them. But I know how, how they score in uh, universities. Uh, for the past few years, I've been kind of signing all these applications. They all come from great universities, like Hong Kong U, but uh, in the last few years, I don't remember signing one that comes from Hong Kong U. Um, they are usually from Harvard, <coughs> Stanford, Princeton, um, and none of them, none of them has a GPA lower than 3.89. Mm. 
so, but I'm sure you can all score um, higher than that, so it's not a problem. <laughs> but it's not the academic grades that matter, because there are a lot of people that has 3.89 or above to choose from. Usually when I look at uh, candidates, I will look for evidence that they have excelled in something, meaning they have the ability to pursue excellence. We do not accept average. So if that person is good in academics and yet also is very good in sports or in organizing student activities or in music, that you excel in one of these areas, then chances are I'll be interested in meeting. But if that person is average in everything, then the question in our mind is, how can we be assured that this person after joining the firm would do well if it's just average? I don't know what the passing mark in Hong Kong U now is. I know that in primary school, in secondary school, it usually is 60 points. So if you score 60 or 100, you are passed. I can tell you, in our firm, If you score 90, you fail. If you score 95, you fail. Meaning if every 100 things you do, you make mistakes in five, you'll be dead. We expect that you'll be 100% correct because we don't usually check the work of the junior people. We assume that your models, your write-ups, your prospectus will be correct. We, and we base our decision based on your correct work and not on something that is only 95% correct. So in the commercial world, in the real life world, we expect that you would excel in everything. And so it is important therefore that even in school, when you do things, you do everything well. So you, from the earthly angle and also from the spiritual angle, because you're working for God, you should do it well. And if you do it well, then chances are you'll be successful in almost everything that you do. I'm sure you will do well in almost everything because you're all smart, you've been given the opportunity, you're in good school, and you have a good attitude. But I'll also mention that um, in life, also in Korea, it is important to have the right bearing, to have the right set of value. If you look at the Wall Street Journal, Financial Times, there are a lot of reports about insider trading, a lot of people kind of driving people in order to get ahead, doing all kinds of things. But you look at them, these are all highly achieved, they are all smart people. These are people that have smart uh, GPAs of 3, 8, 9 or above. How come they do it? It is because in their pursuit of success, they always try to get ahead faster. And if they see a chance that cuts a bit of corner, they can do something faster and be successful, chances are they'll do it. And if they're successful the first time, then they'll do it the second time and chances are the more corners you cut, and you get away with it, then you do the game. And before you know it, you may be making serious mistakes. And this, I believe, if anything, would be the most important advice I would share with you. When you're working and in life, do not make these mistakes. But I can tell you, in today's world, in commercial world, because people judge you judge us by the so-called success that people would usually assign the measures to, which is how much money you make, whether you occupy important positions, whether you occupy powerful positions. Because competition is key, again, it is a global world, you're competing with the best of the best around the world. Sometimes these drive this urge to be successful will somehow cause you to make mistakes. 
I've seen too many of these, and I can only tell you that if it is just based on your so-called conscience, it is very difficult. It is very difficult. Because in conscience, sometimes you sometimes get confused. In order not to be confused, I urge you to read the Bible often. Because in the Bible, there are all kinds of wisdoms. There are a lot of things that would guide you in every respect. As a minimum, the Bible said that we should all act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our Lord. So, and it's not just your conscience, because it is also God watching each and every of our act. And He will judge us when Jesus comes again, whether we have done the wrong thing or the right thing. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm still doing a lot of wrong things, but hopefully it will not be so wrong that I would be ashamed to see Him. So, try to read the Bible and follow the uh, teachings. As the Bible say, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And why I mention the Lord again, because if I contrast it with what is happening in China, that I believe is, um, we are seeing the problem of people not believing in the Lord. The reason why I said it is, even though um, in China there is the legal system, there is the court, but we all know that these instruments, the law and the court, they are fairly crude instruments. And particularly if people, some of the people in China believe that they are above the law, that they cannot be confined by the law, or even if you're not as important, you believe that nobody would watch you nobody can catch you, then you do something that would kind of somehow cause you to get ahead. Just think about this, uh, this uh, choice of options. If you don't believe in afterlife, if you don't believe that in, uh, there is a God that watches us, and if you do not believe that there will be heaven uh, or hell, your earthly life, this life is all you have. If you are poor in China, you are very poor. By the way, I visit the poor villages from time to time in China, they are very poor. And you ask yourself, you know, if I cannot get ahead the legal way or the proper way, I'll be poor for this life, and this life is all I have. I may as well just do something <coughs> illegal. And if I'm, if I'm successful and nobody can catch me, I have all the enjoyment. If I get caught, what's the worst? I got executed. But since this life is all I have, it's probably better than if I'm poor all this life. Because the choice is between an enjoyable or a prosperous life versus a very poor life. But if you believe in afterlife, in heaven and hell, this life, the longest, is only 120 years then there is eternity and there's judgment after we die to decide whether we go to heaven or hell then you think very different because you do not want to be condemned to hell for eternity for the wrongdoings of this life and so I believe that one of the problems in China why we are seeing all these kind of poisonous milk powder poisonous, poisonous soya sauce poisonous uh, vegetable is because people do not believe there is a God. And that's why when I talk to a lot of friends in Beijing, I said the problem with China is not the shadow banking, not just the corruption. Corruption is just a symptom. It's because in China, they do not believe in God. Even though you may have traditional religion, but the traditional religion that we have, which, by the way, I used to believe in some of those, including in fortune telling and feng shui. I was pretty good at it too. <laughs> but none of those would cause you to have the self-constraint like believing in our Lord Jesus Christ. Because in the traditional religion, we would go to Nirvana eventually 
if we do well ourselves. So the doing good is the reason, is the cause, and the result is that eventually you would go to Nirvana. Except that after living for 50 odd years, I find out that I was still doing a lot of wrong things. Don't get me wrong, again, I'm still doing some wrong things, but hopefully I know that I, I'm doing wrong. Um, so if you do not do good things, but next, you still have the next life because you never get to Nirvana until almost eternity. You have a second chance. But in Christianity, there's no second chance. Your early life is your only time. And if you kind of do not believe in him, and chances are if you do not believe in him, you do bad things, then you go to hell. Um, if you believe in Jesus Christ because he loves us, so we love the other people, and we obey his laws, then we will do less bad things. We will go to heaven. So the ability to do good things, I believe, is actually stronger uh, under Christianity. And so I pray and hope that uh, China will be more open uh, to Christianity so that there will be less bad things, including the corruptions that we are seeing happening in China. And I hope that today, if you forget everything, at least you remember that there is a guy that believe that it is important for you to know more about Christianity, to know about the Bible, so that you avoid, especially when you are successful, and become and wanting to become more successful, cutting corners and eventually getting caught and going to jail or worse, going to hell. And so with that, I would pause and uh, I welcome questions and answers. Thank you. Yes. you live out your faith at work and secondly uh, what if faith conflicts with what I'm doing I'll answer the second one first um, if it conflicts with what I'm doing then I'll just not do it like in investing um, when I entered the firm I told my colleagues that I'll invest in everything that is legal except gaming because gaming which is gambling even though it is legal I don't think it's right so I would tell my colleagues up front that I mean, don't even tell me that you're looking at those things because I'm not going to be investing in it. Um, and it is all within your, I mean, obviously I'm more senior so I can decide a lot of things, of, of these things. But when you're a junior, if you sense something is clearly wrong with the teachings of the Bible, then you just refuse to do it. I mean, while, as I said, there may be less and less job opportunities, but I did not, set, I did not say the the, the second part, and that is actually there is more and more opportunities for you to create your own job. And that's why if I have to do education reform again, I would encourage even more creativity, I would encourage even more innovation, I would nurture in an environment that creativity is important. So if something in your work clearly contradicts with the Bible, then I would suggest that you do not do it. How do you live out your faith in, at, at work? It's actually not just at work, but I suppose um, in life as well. Again, uh, I'm a bad Christian, but I would kind of um, share with you some of the examples of those that are better in uh, faith. One, they would not uh, usually tell people that they're Christian. I mean, obviously, they would not deny that they're Christian, but they would not. Uh, oh, kind of openly declare that I'm a Christian 
and they will not kind of uh, whatever they do kind of pray first or close eyes and pray because that may actually um, offend some other people that may not share in the same faith. On the other hand, what they're doing is they would live it out through their behavior, through their manners. Let people find out how come this person is so gentle, so full of love, so helpful to other people, so righteous. Obviously, self-righteous may not be the best thing if you are kind of too arrogant with it. Um, so humble. And then eventually when people found out how come this good person is around, they found that he is actually a godly person, that he's actually a Christian, that he may actually allow other people to explore Christianity much better than if we are just kind of telling people that, are, that we are Christian, that we are following all the laws and rules of Christianity. So live it out rather than just kind of say it out. Because otherwise, uh, you remember the Bible, there's something called the Pharisees. That you just live out all these, or act it out, except that you are not really living Christianity. Because as Christian, as Jesus said, and then somebody asked Jesus, um, Master, which one is the most important commandment? I, I believe, and obviously Peter and Daniel and Grace, they can correct me, uh, because they are much better Christians. Uh, Jesus said, exactly two. Number one is to love your God. And second one is love other people as you love yourself. So if you love other people and you and you act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with your Lord, then eventually people will know that this is what Christian and Christianity is all about. Then I believe this is the best way to kind of live out your faith at work. Yes. Bible said that if you truly believe in Jesus Christ and open it means that you believe in him, then you'll be saved. Now obviously the, somebody will say, well, I mean I openly say this and I believe in him, but then I'm going to I'm going to do all the bad things, I'm going to murder person, murder people and that kind of thing, would I go to uh, <coughs> would I go to heaven? But if you believe in somebody, then it's not just believing uh, in your mouth. You really believe in your heart. And if you believe in your heart, then chances are you do the right thing. So, so the causation, the reason and the result, as I said earlier, is just reversed with other religion. The other religion, you have to do good things, therefore you earn it. Whereas in Christianity, if you believe in Jesus Christ, then you already got the salvation. But then because you believe in Him, then you do good things. So the causation goes just the opposite. So, as the Bible said, if you truly believe in Him and also admit it, then you can say it. And the Bible guarantees it, and the Lord is faithful. Good question. I mean, another. I started believing in feng shui and, um, and fortune telling. Well, I've always believed that uh, there are supernatural spirits. Uh, there are ghosts and there are gods. Except I didn't know who uh, God was. Uh, and also, by the way, uh, in my younger days, I actually resisted Christianity for two reasons. One, he is a whale, foreigner. <coughs> and as a kind of uh, nationalistic person, you know, obviously I rather believe in somebody that is Chinese. Now, uh, I got news for you, as you know, uh, Buddhism comes from India, so he's not actually Chinese. Uh, 
But the other reason why I did not uh, believe in Jesus Christ was even though I was educated in uh, a uh, Christian secondary school, and so I know the Ten Commandments well, the first one was, uh, except him, you cannot believe in other thoughts. So I thought that he was kind of so level-minded, how can you be the only person? Um, so I believe um, in Feng Shui because when I was very young, um, I was a trader. I was trading foreign exchange and money market. And as you know, in the market, you can't really predict a lot of things. And if you can't predict it well, chances are you would like to resort to some outside means to help you, to help you win. And so the, it was kind of customary uh, for us to hire a feng shui person uh, to look at the environment, to look at the trading room, to look at where I sit, to make sure that I have the so-called better chance. I've consulted many the feng shui masters in Hong Kong and many fortune uh, telling masters in Hong Kong, actually the more famous ones I have all seen. Um, I can tell you this, um, for fortune telling, at least my experience is, for things that had happened, they are usually very correct. <laughs> usually very correct, almost uh, 90 plus percent correct. Except for things that had not happened, it's about 50% correct. Now 50%, what is the odds of 50%? You throw a coin at 50%. The problem is when it is 50% and you don't know which 50% it is, it actually interferes with your decision making. When you're faced with something that you think about, oh, what did he say? Then your chances are you trying to uh, do something that is in line with what the fortune teller would say. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. As far as Feng Shui, whether you can change your fate, my answer is no. Because I have some important things I say, well, I really want things, the outcome to change, consult a Feng Shui master, put, thing, put on things here and there, they work. But let me tell you something that uh, is not me, but one of my friends, who actually also believed in Feng Shui and learned Feng Shui. It was a she. Um, she is the student of uh, my last Feng Shui master, who was actually not a professional, but somebody that claims to be quite accurate. And I did not see this woman for a number of years, and uh, after I saw her again, I said, hey, are you still uh, kind of practicing feng shui? And she said, no, I'm not a Christian. At that point, I was already a Christian. I said, wow, you're a Christian? I said, why? She said, no, I mean, um, I calculated that uh, based on kind of ba zi, so the time of birth, that my mother would get sick in this particular year. And before that year, I told my brothers, she said. And the brother said that, you're crazy, and mom is healthy. Uh, and come to that particular year, her mother was actually sick. And she tried to rearrange the feng shui to make sure that she's all right. It didn't quite work. Uh, her mother was dying. And then came a Christian friend. And the Christian friend said, let's pray together. And through the prayer, her mother actually recovered. And she said, well, since even though I know that some of these feng shui or fortune telling may well, meaning it's probably some, some principles, some, you may even call it scientific principles, but who make these rules and principles? Our Lord. And we believe in the Lord that create the principle and also can change the outcome. I mean, as the Bible said, I mean, Jesus actually raised people from the dead, cured people from afar. So, because he is God, he created the principles and he could also, and he still can, change the principle. He said, if I already believe in the highest God, why do I have to believe in this lower order thing? So she quit kind of believing or actually the kind of telling fortunes and the telling feng shui. And I believe the same thing too. Because our Lord is the most powerful. And if you follow the silo, why do you have to believe in the silo? You have the mic? Uh, sorry. Yes, please. You have a rule in the curriculum. If you could give me in one or two, one or two sentences, what is the number one thing 
we should do or learn outside of the curriculum during our university years to prepare to be the next legal shape of <laughs> Well, number one is to have the right value system. So the first one is read the Bible. <laughs> Secondly, have the kind of intellectual curiosity to think outside the box rather than just follow the rules. Uh, professors may hate me because they, um, some professors would like the students to just follow them. Uh, but I believe the bad professors would actually encourage them to think. So think critically and think outside the box, the second thing. Third thing would be, especially in jobs where you have to interact with people and you're going to research that's different. Um, the one skill that we also would like to see is teamwork. While you may be very good, but in at least the commercial world, you cannot succeed by just doing it your own. You have to work with teams. So the ability to work in a team and possibly to lead a team, but many times you'll be just a team member, is very important. Fourthly, ability to communicate. If you are good, but you cannot communicate what good is it, at least in the commercial world. And so if you have this, I think you'll be all right. I think we have time just for this last question. Uh, to Anthony, do you want to choose somebody? Ah, don't worry. I'll choose, I'll choose three. One, two, and three. Okay. <laughs> Well, firstly, you have to define what is successful. Um, if it's successful by making money, there's one measurement. The other is if you have a senior position, there's another one. But I think the God probably has his own measurement. If you kind of do everything well and do everything in, a, in accordance with the Bible, um, then at least you have inner peace. That can be also successful. Because believing in the Lord doesn't mean that you have everything that you want. Our Lord is not Wang Tai Xin. He will not agree everything that you ask for. I mean, in traditional uh, or in other religions, sometimes you give him offering, he will give you something back, uh, back. That may not be a religion that you want because that is what you call a trade or worse still, a bribery. But if you believe in our God, chances are you may also have challenges, you may also have problems, you may have also disasters. But it's the difference in how we treat all these challenges. Because if you believe in our Lord, you have inner peace. That I believe is the most important. But the Lord has his arrangements. The timing would be very different. Like when I left government, I have three and a half, of, three and a half years without work, full-time work. Um, while I wasn't suffering economically or um, I had enough means to live on, but the feeling of not being able to deploy your skills and experience was not fun. Was not fun. But on the other hand, I think it's through that period that I had the time to think through a number of things. And it was only during this that, that period that I discovered our Lord. So Lord has his way in kind of calling me in. Um, and I believe that actually that was the best reward. And obviously, I ended up in Blackstone. Actually, before Blackstone, I was setting up my own company. Uh, maybe financially, I would be better off having my own company. So on the other hand, I'm happy where I am. Um, doesn't mean that I will not change, because Lord has his way of giving me opportunities. And if there are opportunities that would fit his calling and also to my priorities, then maybe I'll change. So, so what I'm saying is that uh, his timing, his arrangements may not be exactly what you or I would wish, but have trust in him that his arrangement is the best. And in the meantime, you have inner peace and a lot of joy. Hi, I would like to ask you, Sandra, you've devoted all your life to uh, the financial, financial 
financial industry. And I think uh, I know that you're making some decision for the educational field as well. So um, as a student from the Faculty of Education and with very limited uh, work experience, I would really like to know that what's the connections and what's the balance you see between these two industries. Because I personally consider that the um, commercial markets need very rapid and fast development, while the educational industry need very steady and slow development. So how do you see the balance and connection between these two? Well, you know, first of all, uh, I did not get into education because I was in finance. Uh, but somehow, in Hong Kong, as you know, uh, there was this university grants committee system that they had a lot of so-called lay members. So I joined as a lay member and directly became chairman. But I believe that even though um, the two seems to be different, the knowledge and the experience in management is the same in education because you need to organize and get the resources and make sure that they are being allocated fairly and make sure that also the products of education, meaning the students, are meeting the demands of the society, which commercial field is uh, one of the more important sectors, or at least one important sector. You talk about the speed of change in the commercial world, um, things happen very fast, and in education, things are happening very slowly. That is the case, but on the other hand, I would submit that that should not be the case. Because what you are doing, or what education is doing, is trying to produce or and kind of nurture a person so that they can contribute to the society, and the society, whether it's commercial or scientific, is evolving very fast. I think people in this generation, or at least the older generation, in some countries they have seen actually two important shifts in their lifetime. In some countries they evolved from agricultural society to industrial society, and from the industrial, industrial society to now the knowledge economy, all within the last 100 years. And the knowledge economy is evolving very fast, as you know. I mean, uh, the apples and the Samsung that you're using have computing power that are millions of times bigger than the first stage of computer or even the second stage. So, so that's why I said the education that the education reform that we set out to, or that we recommended 10 years ago, if I look back today, it is another reform, even though it may not be as wide ranging as 10 years ago, it needs to be tinkered and changed. And herein lies the problem of education because I know that I'm going to get into trouble. Most teachers in Hong Kong were taught under the industrial society. And in the industrial society, they focus on division of labor so that you can actually reduce the cost of doing things by doing things repetitively. But in the knowledge economy, it's not about division of labor, it's not about specialty. It's about merging knowledge together to create something new. And something new may not be for the mass market, but maybe customized for each individual customer. And so the breadth of knowledge is going to be vast. And hence, we want our students to have the ability to absorb and to synthesize a lot of knowledge. And by the way, it's not just knowledge that education should be teaching. Now I have children. You know, when I was doing education reform, I did not have children. So I was kind of doing it uh, kind of out of theory, obviously with a lot of help from uh, my education friends and a lot of uh, help from Bernadette who helped us in the PR. But what we should focus on would be not just knowledge, because with knowledge, with Google, two seconds, you get almost everything. You don't have to remember it. But you know, you have to learn how to learn. You have to somehow distill the knowledge into wisdom, which in the Chinese education system, we do not focus enough on. And also, we do not focus enough on the value system. Because without the value system, as I said, you drift. And the more knowledgeable you are, but you do not have a strong value system to guide you, chances are you may be using the fast amount of knowledge to, to do something bad. So, so I'm encouraging the uh, education uh, experts to think about how to adjust the education for tomorrow's world, which is going to be changing extremely fast. 
and it's going to be fascinating and yet on the other hand very confusing. How do we inculcate into our students the right value system, the urge to learn and to really do something that is going to be good for the human society. And that I believe is more important than just kind of passing on the knowledge. As I said, the knowledge you can get it from Google in two seconds. Okay. Angie, I'm sorry to stop now. Thank you very much for your generosity of time and wisdom and counsel. Um, we want to just thank, first of all, just say thank you. But uh, Anthony Long has immense opportunities and invitations for him to come back to Hong Kong to speak to you today. Um, it's just indication that he's already living his eulogy, <laughs> his legacy, uh, to give back to Hong Kong and to make a difference in the future. Um, he's been a supporter to us at the Faith Initiative, and next month, October 22nd, his friend and former colleague, Dr. Rosanna Wong. Of course. At a class, well, not a class, but a schoolmate. Schoolmate. She's we'll be younger, so. We'll speaking at our next faith at work, October 22nd. So please check out our website and register for that. Thank you very much. Thank you.